now I realize that uh, <laughs> I was not, uh, I didn't have uh, my camera on. Okay, so hopefully now everything works. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll give it a few minutes to set up. So as I was saying, um, I'm uh, in Lake Placid this week uh, looking at the foliage change, so I actually don't have my Bolti screen set up. As a result, I can't actually easily uh, share a presentation, so I decided after uh, four episodes that for this fifth episode, we I just ask the audience's questions, see how it goes, and uh, based on that, um, decide if that's the type of episode we should be doing on a regular basis or what the correct cadence is for these Ask Me Anything type sessions. Anyway, uh, with this intro, apparently this works everywhere. Um, let me um, let me get the ball rolling. So, welcome to playing with episode. Uh, wait, blah, start over. <laughs> welcome to playing the unicorns, episode five. This week, I'm covering everything or any questions you might have for me or any ideas you may want to pitch. Okay, we're getting a fair amount of questions already, so uh, I'll put uh, this view on so you can also enjoy the beautiful Lake Placid view while we're at it. So um, the first question that I think is interesting is um, what's the impact of the antitrust laws and maybe regulation in general uh, on tech and, and for the tech sector and for maybe for, the intro for, for startups? And it's actually interesting because I can be, or you can make an argument that goes both ways. On the one hand, uh, allowing new startups to create competition for incumbents is actually a really good thing. And in a way, you could say that they've been stifled or can be stifled in a certain categories. At the same time, if you don't do it intelligently, and if you also prevent like bolt-on acquisitions or acqui hires, you actually can starve the entire venture ecosystem of capital because if you think of how the the, the funnel works, obviously the entrepreneurs come up with the ideas, the venture cap, while well, the angels start funding them, then the venture capitalists um, keep funding them, and eventually they need an exit. Now, a few get really big and can go public, but for the vast majority, the exit path is actually an acquisition, and usually by the larger tech companies. And so, if that actually avenue goes away, be it the acquires or the small acquisitions, etc., that would probably be really difficult and really catastrophic for the tech sector as a whole and probably catastrophic for the U.S. economy as a whole. Today, the tech sector is the only source of economic growth and productivity growth that is keeping the economy, the economy running in, in, in these dark times. And so it'd be great if we could have intelligent regulation, meaning don't allow existing incumbents to extend uh, their dominance by acquiring people that are directly competitive, but do let them do bolt-on acquisitions, et cetera. Otherwise, you might risk uh, destroying the entire ecosystem and, frankly, the underlying engine of economic growth. My concern is um, observing the different hearings where people are making political points rather than being thoughtful so that the regulation is going to be heavy-handed and not particularly smart or intelligent. And I'm particularly worried of things in terms that are onerous, right? If you tell tech companies they have to be responsible for their content or you make it very difficult to abide by regulations, you're actually not helping competitors. You're actually entrenching the incumbents because who has the the money and the labor force to actually abide by regulations? Of course, it's the larger companies. It's a lot easier for Google or Facebook to hire a lot of people to follow complex roles than it is for a startup. And so I tread very lightly and I'd be very thoughtful from both a regulatory perspective and an antitrust perspective. Let me uh, look at a few other questions. So Zach is asking me, you know, is, is mentioning that we've been successful at FJ Labs and I've been successful as, as an angel investor um, by making decisions really quickly and is wondering why are VCs in the early stages wasting a lot of time with due diligence? Why are they... and, and and whether or not for FJ Labs has taking or external capital change your processes. Now, the thing is most people, when they raise external capital, they raise it from institutional investors. And these institutional investors have expectations. And part of these expectations is kind of a checklist actually often is 
Do you do due diligence? Do you take a board seat? Uh, also, most VCs have a rather concentrated portfolio. And so in their cases, they feel like they need to do this work. Often, to be honest, I feel that it's kind of like, I don't know if it's a jumping it through a hoop, but it's just like crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and and, and pretending to have done you know real work uh, rather than actually elucidating or adding uh, visibility in terms of why you are in, in terms of your decision making process if anything often I find that the longer I take to make a decision the worse my decision is um, the and, and, and the first analysis given the number of at bats I've had uh, and given that it's somewhat driven by both data and heuristics in addition to my intuition works better Clearly for us at FJ Labs, since we've taken external capital, there's a number of things we, we, we've changed. I mean, it, back in the day, uh, before I started working with Jose and, with, and having FJ Labs, people would, after I'd commit into an investment, whatever the amount, 50K or 100K or 250K, I would actually not even bother to read the legal documents. I would auto-sign everything they ever sent me from the day of the investment all the way to the exit. And I wouldn't even read them. And I figured I it had no impact. Now, we now have a fiduciary duty to our LPs to to make sure that um, we also cross <laughs> our T's and dot our I's. So we now have an entire back office team. We actually read stock purchase agreements. We try to negotiate preemptive rights, provider rights, et cetera. We don't always get them, but we try to. And um, it, it made us a little bit slower. Obviously, we have such a large deal flow now that instead of being one meeting with me and we decide, usually it's filtered and there is a first meeting with a member of the team that writes a, a debrief and then it leads to a second meeting with either Jose or I uh, or me to decide what, what we do next. The This changed. That said, we try to, get, to stay true to our focus. And I think ultimately it will probably limit the type of LPs we can have because we don't want to have concentrated portfolios. We don't want to be on boards. We don't want to be competing with VCs. We want to be their friends. And it probably also limits the ultimate fund size. I don't expect FJ Labs to have a multi-billion dollar fund uh, anytime soon, if frankly ever, just because we would then be competing for allocation in the major VCs, which is not what we're trying to do. You know, when Bessemer or Sequoia is writing a five or six or seven or $10 million check, we're more than happy to write a 500K check. And that also means we're probably not leading, we're not setting the price, we're not taking board seats, et cetera, and that's totally fine by us. Let me scroll down. How did I, so Joe Joao is asking, how did I acquire the first customers at OLX? Um, and maybe it's a more general question, if you're building a marketplace, do you start with the supply side or the demand side? Do you start with the sellers or the buyers? Now, in general, most uh, marketplaces are demand constrained because if you go to a supplier or a seller and you tell them, hey, I potentially have customers for you and I don't charge any listing fee, most of them are willing to do a task or be there. So when you're building your marketplace, you typically start, and that's true of 99% of marketplaces, the demand constrained rather than supply constrained, you start with the supply side. And so that's exactly what we did at FJ Labs. We kind of had a sales team, and in the various major countries, we approached um, short to mid-tail sellers of like car dealers, real estate brokers, uh, stores that had collectibles, and and convinced them to, to list on, on, on OLX. And that was in 2006, we did that in a number of countries. And then we try to match the supply and demand by buying long tail uh, keywords on, in SEM. Now, there was a time where the competition for buying ads on, on Google and Facebook, et cetera, was a lot less sophisticated. And so most people were just buying, you know, buy used car. And if you were buying, you know, buy BMW X5 2005, uh, 10,000 miles uh, yellow, uh, because there's very little volume, no one was bidding for these, but the CPCs were a lot lower. And so we, we did that very effectively for many years. Um, obviously, we started, we had a mix of SEO and um, other acquisition channels. Ultimately, in the long run, we did TV, but much, much later, once we had actually already reached capacity or scale in a few countries. Now, by having this approach, we, we were able to get traction in four countries, um, Brazil, India, Pakistan, and Portugal. And well, we tried 100 countries to be clear. We spent about 50K, so not that much in 100 countries. So it's 5 million total, it's only 50K per country. And that was enough to match supply and demand intelligently and, and, and to be successful. And so then we focused on these four, became large and profitable, and then reuse that to expand 
to to the other countries. And another thing we did, uh, kind of a hack or a trick, is we were competing with like larger, sometimes publicly traded companies, be they eBay or Shipstead or, or Mercado Libre, who, who don't really have the same ethos and dynamism as, as a startup. And so they would buy, bid on the short-term keywords like used car, and that's a very expensive keyword with a lot of volume. But they would put like in the evenings after 5 or 6 p.m. or in the weekends on Friday at 6 p.m., they wouldn't actually be bidding and monitoring what they were doing. And so they would say, okay, for the weekend, I put a budget of on this keyword of whatever, $10,000, $5,000, $100,000, and they put a maximum they're willing to pay. And so the, we try to figure out when they were no longer paying attention, and then we would bid, we would increase our bid on that short tail keyword. We actually would start bidding just then, increase it to one penny less than them. So they would actually be paying instead of 10 cents a click, maybe a dollar a click. Their budget would run out. The minute we'd be number one in the auction, we'd, we'd decrease our bid and boom, we'd be number one on a short tail keyword at a very low CPC with no competition for the entire weekend and the entire night. And we did that for years and you know, companies like eBay or Shipstead, you know, didn't figure or market our leave, but I didn't pay attention and didn't figure it out the and and so there's when you think about it when you're a startup uh, you have speed you have you have uh you can you can be more aggressive you can work harder than than the incumbents so they have more money uh but they 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 move slowly and and the people that are doing the work are not as embedded or wedded to to the ultimate success it, it's funny that they really never realize this So Sergey Stupak, and I apologize if I'm completely butchering your name, is asking, what's the best advice to building personal brand in VC, especially in junior roles? The I'm seeing a lot of approaches. Uh, first of all, I'm not, I don't know to what extent it matters or not. And, and, and in a way, asking me for VC advice is not the best because I didn't come into VC. I never had the ambition of being a venture capitalist. I was always, first and foremost, a tech entrepreneur. I still see myself as a tech entrepreneur. And it just so happens that by virtue of being a consumer-facing internet CEO, a lot of people started asking for investment. And so I started investing in these startups. I thought it was interesting. It was value-added both for them and for me in, in my day job. It made me a better entrepreneur to see all the different trends. And, um, and so by 2013, once I left OLX, I'd already made over 100 investments. I'd already had many exits. It was very successful. And so ultimately, when I transitioned to being a VC in 2016, it was kind of a continuation of my existing efforts. So if you're a junior VC, I'd, st I'd say try to be thoughtful on on and, and come up with theses and perspectives. I would probably publish these. I don't know, either if you have your own blog, you could do it there, or Medium, or maybe your, your, your fund or firm's uh, site. Um, some people do podcasts, some people, I mean, they're different approaches, but frankly, at the end of the day, if you can create, if you can source amazing deals, if you be super helpful to the entrepreneurs, I think it'll start through word of mouth, uh, coming out and your deal flow will improve and, and your ability to make decisions given the number of vests you get will improve as well. Um, so not sure, obviously I'm, I'm not doing playing with unicorns to build a brand. I think it's more like, and, and frankly, I really see this as kind of quasi altruism. It's like everything I wish I knew as a tech founder when I was 20, you know, sadly 26 years ago at this point that, that I now know and, um, uh, and try to, to break it down in like digestible tidbits, uh, that, that can be used. And, and that's why in some of the, you know, while I already covered things like fundraising in the upcoming episodes, I want to cover things like how do I come up with the, or how do we come up in, at FJ labs with like business ideas? How do we evaluate these ideas were then good or bad and um, many other such topics. So Leon is asking, what are the high leverage activities people should be working on? And I assume by that you mean entrepreneurs in general. Look, I think the reality and the answer, and the answer, frankly, to many of these things is it depends. The What is most high leverage for your organization may be very different from someone else. Some organizations or or driven by sales, in which case uh, having a, me a lot of meetings and creating a brand in your category as the leader might might be the relevant the, the, the right play. Um, if you're early in, in the life of your organization, you're trying to figure out what, you know, find product market fit, talking to people about how you can do that best if you don't actually know how to do that, might make the most sense. The, the life, and maybe I'll generalize, the life of the entrepreneur 
is one where we live with constraints. The constraints are how much capital we have, it's always limited, how much tech resources we have, it's always limited, and how much time we personally have, it's always limited. And so it says much about what you choose not to do than it is about what you choose to do. We are not in a position, given the limited resources we have, to be boiling the ocean. We have to make very deliberate choices. So you need to figure out what is the most high leverage activity in your business and, 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 and allocate all your resources to that. And, and not try to do everything because it, it's not going to work. Now, in the process of doing that, you may do a lot of multivariate testing. You may do, you know, throwing a lot of the spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks. But once you've actually figured out things that work, you know, definitely focus on these things rather than trying to do a little bit of everything else. Uh, Joseph Rossello is asking if foreign startups can succeed in the U.S. And what is my experience in, in with foreign firms setting up here? The, well, first of all, the, if you think of like, the traction you can get these days, there are companies, especially in things like social media, where absolutely, right? Like gaming companies or TikTok. Think of TikTok is, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, a Chinese company, and they have extraordinary success in the U.S. from a, from a traction perspective. Now, if you're in things like, like marketplaces, e-commerce that are transactional, obviously you need to be able to accept payments. Perhaps you need uh, you need you, you need a, lo- a certain level of logistics, etc. The I've seen a number of companies either reincorporate in the U.S. or create U.S. entities and actually start getting a lot of traction. And I can think of a lot of the larger European players, companies like Klarna, who are coming to the U.S. and being reasonably successful. And so it's absolutely doable. The question is, does it make sense? Is that where the the, the, the best category is for you next? The I don't think the U.S. market is that compl- complicated. In fact, if, if I have to choose where to launch, um, it would, I would launch in the U.S. and frankly ignore the rest of the world. Right? Frankly, my main advice to U.S. founders is don't go global. And, and the reason is when you're at 100 million in revenues in the U.S., it's easier to go from 100 to 200 than it is to go from zero to 100 in the rest of the world. And that's usually true at a billion. It's usually true at 10 billion. And because the valuations are higher, you're usually in a position to to go and acquire the other players if, if people launch or the Summer Brothers created clones so that actually makes sense for you to acquire. Um, that's certainly a better path than actually distracting yourself and, and trying to win abroad. If um, Uber had to do it again, I suspect that not launching all these countries and actually either buying Lyft uh, when they had the option to or killing them and focusing on that would probably have been more valuable to them than having basically wars globally that was distracting them from winning in the US. And and that's the issue. If you're if you're launching elsewhere, you're distracting yourself. So to answer your question, if you're if you're a foreign player, should you enter the US? Well maybe you should even launch in the US first if you can, if you have the the capital and the wherewithal. And by the way, incorporating the US not all that hard, getting billing systems working not all that hard. If you're already successful in a country, could the US be your next country? perhaps. Um, obviously, look at the competitive nature and, and dynamic. Um, make sure that your English skills are, are, are good enough that you're going to be able to attract American VCs and convince them. For many Europeans, though, it feels scary. And so after France, you go to Germany, or after Germany, you go to the UK, and you go pan-European. It may or may not make sense. I mean, part of the issue is a lot of the companies in the rest of the world usually are copying ideas from the US. And so... You, that means there's an incumbent in the U.S. doing this, usually a lot larger and, <laughs> and much further ahead. And so th- that said, if there's an idea that's innovative that you've come up with that's doing extraordinarily well in your market and it's not being done in the U.S., of course, if you can do it in the U.S., do it in the U.S. It's a much, much better market. So are we currently in a tech bubble? Um, you know, what's interesting is over the last, um, mm, well, 15 years for sure, that question has kept popping up. And I think people don't understand what a tech bubble is. And I lived through the 98, 99, 2000 tech bubble. And that was a time where just on your pedigree, people would invest in you. And, and companies that had zero revenues, frankly, zero hope of revenues, were worth billions of dollars. The, it was a time where I remember receiving by fax binding term sheets from investors I never even talked to to invest millions of dollars in my company. I mean, that's a bubble. That makes absolutely no economic sense in any way, shape, or form. Now, because interest rates are, are, are rather low right now, it's it's been inflating asset prices across the board, and tech prices especially because we have been the creator of economic growth and productivity growth. And so valuations are frothy. 
perhaps not completely unjustified, given that this is where the economic growth is coming from. In, in a world of zero interest rates, the valuations you can justify are actually rather high. Now, should that change, uh, there could be a, a reckoning and, and coming back to earth. Uh, so I could say, I guess I would say valuations are frothy, though we are not in a bubble. A bubble-like environment or ones where people expect things to never go down. There's a new paradigm. The old rules don't apply. You know, crypto a few years ago was definitely in that in that bucket. Um, real estate, of course, in the 07, 08 uh, period or 06, 07 period. And uh, tech in the 80, 98, 99, 2000 bubble period. We're not there yet. Could we get there? Possibly. If interest rates stay too low too long, I suspect we might have an everything bubble, meaning every asset class will be overvalued. Um, fixed income or bonds, uh, equities in general, and, and, and tax specifically. And so I could really well see all asset class being inflated uh, because in a in a low interest rate environment where there's no inflation, I suspect that the inflation it doesn't happen in the goods you buy on a day-to-day basis, partly because tech is actually deflationary and moving prices down, but actually it expresses itself, that inflation, in asset prices. And so we're seeing asset price inflation everywhere, and I expect that to continue and as long as interest rates stay as low as they are and as long as there's that much liquidity out there from a combination of quant- quantitative easing, uh, massive fiscal easing by all the governments around the world to fight this coming recession. Now, I don't expect inflation because there's been demand that's been very constrained, unemployment remains high, and, and we're on the verge of a massive wave of personal and small business bankruptcies, um, which is sad, sad for those people um, facing it. But the I could very well see asset price inflation and tech tech valuations remaining frothy for a time to go. Uh, so Sumir is asking whether SaaS startups should be um, should be geographic agnostic or not. And and the answer as usual is it depends right like how is your product sold if your product uh, and, and who is it applicable to many the startups that i would recommend to go global which is kind of the opposite of my original you know recommendation don't go global it, or the startups where there's no where where it's user generated content where it's self serve where where people can just buy your product immediately so if you have an amazing product that people just want uh, it's true that buying ads nationally and, and actually globally is actually cheaper than, um, than than buying ads in a very specific region. Now, if you're sold by a sales team that needs to be meeting decision makers in person, that's a very different answer. So in general, to the extent possible, I mean, depends on the nature of your SaaS business or your marketplace, buying ads nationally great because it's cheaper, but there may be components of like you build more credibility and you have more liquidity um, in, in marketplaces, if you're hyper local and in the SaaS businesses, you know, if you need to be doing sales meetings, and also if you sign one big client in a category, you can maybe sign other clients in this category. It may make sense to, uh, it may make sense to focus there. That said, if you have a self serve product that anyone can use, why not, you know, make it available everywhere? So Genius Morty is asking, what are my thoughts on impact investing from a venture capital lens? Now, what's interesting is, um, and, and I'll talk about, I'll even generalize it, like philanthropy versus impact investing versus being a traditional venture capitalist and supposedly or notionally uh, focusing on returns. And and I guess it, it comes down to why what is your underlying mission? Why are you doing what you're doing? And if I look at myself, uh, the reason I'm a tech entrepreneur, the reason I am I like to invest in startups is because startups improve broken user experiences. So they create higher NPS experiences. And at the same time, because they're innately deflationary, they improve people's purchasing power. And so they decrease inequality of opportunity. They decrease uh, uh, social injustice and, and, and they're better for humanity writ large. They, they, they think of, um, you know, poor Indian farmer with a smartphone today. He has more access to information than the president of the United States had 20 years ago or global commu- communications with, you know, WhatsApp video calls is free global communications. And with Wikipedia and Google in his pocket, he has access to the sum total of humanity's knowledge. It is absolutely game changing. And these are the type of things we take for granted. But it's also true of most of the bar- marketplaces we invest in. They, 
they remove bias because it's, it's algorithms. And not to say algorithms cannot be biased. We're picking the best provider for you, uh, regardless of race, gender, etc. And because they're they're cheaper, they they allow people to to buy more and have better experiences. Not to mention the user experiences in general are better. And so, even though ultimately you're 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 measured on returns because that sh- that shows whether or not you're having an impact. Or, in the sense that people are buying the product and liking it and are successful, the underlying mission, I, and I think that many entrepreneurs are mission-driven. They they face a fundamental issue in their life and they address, they intend to fix it. Like they, they, they felt they were discriminated against by the bank that were not giving them a loan. So they're creating a new loan product. They, there are a num- number of ways you can come up with the ideas, but many people are fundamentally mission-driven and, and, and that's actually fantastic. And if I look at the reason we have the quality of life we have today in 2020 relative to, let's say, 220 years ago, where life expectancy was below 30 on average in the world, below 40 in every country in the world, where people worked 70 hours a week, seven days a week to barely survive, 96% of humanity was was in extreme poverty, is the technology revolution of the productivity and the quality and the increases in, in wages and and, and that, that have come through technology and technology being applied in the economy for the last 200 years, then I expect that to continue. And so inequality of outcome has fundamentally decreased. The, the quality of life we have today, especially in the West, would make the kings of yesteryear blush. Now, it's not to say that everything is for the best in the best of possible worlds. We still have fundamental gender and social injustice and equality, especially inequality of opportunity, our, our school systems kind of suck because we fund them through local property taxes, which entrenches inequality. Or our, our healthcare system is, is, is definitely doesn't serve uh, the mass as well. The public services are, are horrendously backwards. So there's a lot that needs to be done. But things have been moving in the correct direction. And, uh, and tech is the main vector for doing that. And so I'm fundamentally optimistic that this is the main way to improve the, the world on a go forward basis and and in and, and this time where we've lost faith in our politicians i i see the tech sector as the means of actually solving these problems and by the way the other fundamental problem that humanity is facing is climate change it's an existential threat and because it's kind of the fallacy of the commons where you, you everyone takes these public goods whether it's the air or air quality as given and 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 no one's making the global collective uh, efforts to to actually decrease our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions, I think it's going to have to come to tech. And the good news there is there's a, a lot of things coming down the pipe that will have fundamental impact. So if you look at the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and um, they're basically split in four sectors. You have 25% coming from energy production. You have about 25% coming from agricultural production. You have 20% from manufacturing. And then you have uh, 16% coming from transportation. And on all of these fronts, you're seeing massive improvements in technology in terms of uh, solar is becoming cheaper every year, storage is becoming cheaper. So at some point, we're going to be able to move all of our electricity production to solar and renewables. Already over half of the new capacity added is renewables. Most of that is solar. It's already cheaper than other forms from a creation perspective, not yet storage, but we're getting there. And I'm, I'm think I'm going to give a speech on why I'm at fundamentally optimistic at some point in the coming weeks on uh, on the future of humanity and our ability to change the fundamental problems we're facing. Uh, same thing is happening in food production in terms of we're, we're seeing progress in lab grown meat to the point we can and we can imagine having um, lower gr- methane gas emissions from from sheep and, and from cows in the future through a combination of like uh, a company like Mutual that will give you a feed that decreases the greenhouse gas emissions or having lab grown meat completely same industry in transport where we're rapidly electrifying all of the, the cars and we're seeing not just efforts from Tesla but all across the board. Now, should there be or should you social impact or do philanthropy? Perhaps the I use philanthropy slightly differently because my philanthropic efforts don't have the same level of leverage, right? So I pay for the education of 10,000 kids, K through 12 in Cabarete and in the Dominican Republic and frankly, the Dominican Republic writ large. And that's fantastic. And it's game and life changing for these 10,000 kids. But it doesn't impact the world with millions of, of lives or billions of lives being touched. And if I look at a company like the one I built, OLX, where we have 350 million unique visitors a month, 
we have millions of people making a living off the site. That actually changes, you know, we're part of the fabric of society in many countries. And, and it changes the lives of many, many more people. And even though it's a for-profit entity, given that most of the services are free, it actually has more impact globally than my non-for-profit initiatives. But my non-for-profit initiatives change the lives of the people I help probably more dramatically than what technology does writ large. But this technology brought to across every different every or technology at large brought about every sector every geography etc ultimately fundamentally transforms people's lives for the better so joao is asking which startups that failed before would succeed nowadays because of the timing in the market now what's interesting is many of the startups that are successful today actually um failed back in the day. So if you remember the 99, 2000 period, you know, Webvan failed in, in, uh, in terms of being a local, uh, grocery store. And now we have fresh direct or Instacart. We had pets.com that, that failed in, in terms of selling, uh, um, do dog food and dog toys, etc., and accessories. And now you have Chewy, you have PetSmart, they're doing really well. And so actually a lot of the original ideas from, from the, from the late nineties, like Cosmo for, for, for delivery, for instance, didn't work well in a world without smartphones where you had your GPS, et cetera, where you didn't have great integrated payment systems now work and, and have changed. So I'd have to think through, obviously these examples from the late nineties have kind of all been done. I'd have to think through things that failed in the past, um, you know, decade that that maybe the time has come for. But uh, nothing comes to mind. But clearly, there that is a true that many of the ideas that were actually fundamentally good is just the execution of them was not there. And you can make the unit economics work with the technology uh, and the service providers of the time. Leon Lin, yes, he, uh, he's say, saying, I guess, agreeing with me that GDPR is entrenching incumbents and hindering startups. Absolutely. I mean, that's my fundamental concern with uh, these regulations. It, it's their people are using them to appear to be doing something or to appear. And, and some of the, I, I guess, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And the very often they think, oh, we'll put these regulations, it'll, it'll make it harder for the incumbents. But really, the only thing it does that makes it hard for the startups, the incumbents can always deal with the regulation. I wish regulators in general were smarter, but ultimately I've seen in every category, regulators get co-opted. And so you saw it in the airline industry back in the day when it was an oligopolistic market, you saw it, you see it in utilities. And so sadly, I, I'm not particularly hopeful that we're gonna see smart regulation. And uh, I'd like people to tread very lightly because you want to let startups continue to disrupt the incumbents. You want startups to continue to be innovative, especially given it's kind of the last engine of economic growth in the world today. So Victoria's saying that some uh, entrepreneurs are getting tired of the hunt for, for unicorns. Like why does something need to be uh, a unicorn? And, and the answer actually is that things don't need to be unicorns. Um, most entrepreneurs are actually not venture-backed entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs around the world are small business entrepreneurs that are building restaurants and they're building nail salons or, or hairdressers. So most people who are entrepreneurs are actually not building these, these unicorns. Now, if you want to be venture-backed and you want to raise tens of millions of dollars from VCs, then you kind of have to aspire to be a unicorn. Otherwise, it doesn't justify the capital that's invested. And so I'm not saying that these unicorn type startups or the cheese for unicorn is the end all be all. Um, quite the contrary. It's, it's very laudable. And most of the American economy, most of the jobs of the American economy are traditional small business entrepreneurs who, who are the lifeblood of the economy. And so and most of them don't have the aspiration or ambition or not building men that, that should be venture backed and will not be unicorns. And that's totally okay. But in the context of raising millions of dollars, then you need to have this aspiration. Otherwise the, the economics don't work because you need to remember most startups fail. The five year survival rate of a startup that has raised at least 500K in seed money is about 7%. And given that most startups fail, 
that won't survive need to pay for these losses. And, and the way to kind of uh, make the math work is actually having in your portfolio some of these unicorns so that pay for all the losses. In the case of FJ Labs, we're a little bit different because we're playing money ball rather than power ball, and we make money on about 50% of the investments. But nonetheless, we still need companies to be in a position to create hundreds of millions of value, ideally, in order to pay for the ones that don't. Uh, Subiram is asking what experience we have in Africa and uh, whether or not the anemone strategy would work to build a, a unicorn there. Um, it's two separate questions, and I think I'll, I'll address the MNA one in general, not just in Africa. But in Africa, the for a long time, and not, we'd focus only in a few markets. For a long time, we focused on the U.S., on Western Europe. We focused on... Uh, on India and on Brazil, and these markets are large. They have uh, they have not only angels, but they also have like VCs that'll fund every stage, and then they have exits. And so the problem with the other markets um, in general was that something was missing in the value chain. Maybe the A and B investors were not there. Maybe the exits were in there. And so if you were in in Chile, for instance, there was this great initiative called Startup Chile to build startups there. The thing is the domestic market market was too small, there were no exits, and also you can get AB funded. So yes, build your company there, but then the f next recommendation is go to Brazil or go to the US. So those are okay, but not great. Now, there's been a fundamental democratization of, of the ability to create software. It's be with open source, with the low-code, no-code revolution, it's cheaper than ever before to build to build startups. And we're seeing tech ecosystems emerge all around the world. We're, we're, we're seeing now, not only in like Paris and Berlin and London, but we're seeing it in Nairobi. We're ever seeing it in Lagos. We're seeing it, frankly, in every major country because it it's cheaper than ever before to build a startup. And so we started looking at now that we have this explosion of creativity, this explosion of innovation coming from entrepreneurs from all around the world, what would be the next markets for us at FJ Labs after US, you know, Western Europe and the Nordics, um, uh, India and Brazil? And we st we started looking at the ones where we already had a co companies that were emerging, which usually leads to other companies doing well. So all of a sudden we had a Rappi come out of Colombia, which is leading a lot of innovation there, and in and, and Mexico. So we have Colombia and Mexico where we started investing a fair amount. And in Africa, there's especially, I guess, three markets where we're seeing a lot of innovation and where we started playing. And those are uh, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, because of the population in those respective countries in South Africa, which was already reasonably rich. So in Kenya, for instance, we're investors in a company called Lori Systems, which is a online freight forwarder. We looked at a number of companies in, in, um, in Nigeria. We almost invested in Trade Depot, which is a B2B grocery marketplace. We actually didn't pull the trigger. And we're actually now actively looking, but specifically in these three markets. Now, in I, mean, I guess in Southeast Asia, we're currently looking at Pakistan. We also, in the Middle East, we're looking at Egypt. So those would be the next level of countries, maybe Indonesia as well. So those would be the countries we would add that we will consider, eh, perhaps even Malaysia. The, um, now, in terms of is m a or doing a roll-up a viable strategy, perhaps, but that's more of a private equity play than as a venture play. We... We mostly like to invest in companies that are scalable and can grow through a scalable acquisition channel rather than m and The M&A ones are typically much more capital and efficient. And, and so could you build one? Possibly wouldn't be the type of things we would necessarily get involved with, though. So... On Twitch, uh, Sun, I guess Sanchez, uh, perhaps, is asking, what's the best way to build VCs, a relationship with VCs? Not because you want funding, because you're typically resourceful, informed, want to get a sense of what's going on. Um, so junior VCs are more than happy to spend time with you, chit-chatting about the space and building relationships while waiting for your round, for your future round. And... Um, they typically hang out like at various tech meetups and tech conferences, et cetera. And frankly, you can even, especially the ones that are a bit more public, you can reach out to them. Uh, very often, they will identify you, right? The job of an associate VC in, in many companies is like find the fast growing companies and start building a rapport and a relationship. So you can have these conversations, whether they're valuable to you or not, 
unclear. I, I don't usually spend any time fundraising absent the, the times where I am fundraising because most VCs really just want to talk to you then. And so I prefer to just run very tight processes. It's like, okay, we're starting process we're f to fundraise. I'm going to talk to these 10 VCs this week, the next 10 VCs next week, try to get in line uh, the same, everything in sync in terms of uh, when you when you get a part of meetings, when you get a term sheet, this way everything's happening at the same time. The problem in the informal conversations is should they lead, for instance, to a term sheet? You have nothing happening. You have no other competing bid. It may not be when you want it. You're not going to be optimizing. You're, 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 you may end up allocating too much time to these conversations and you're definitely not optimizing the process to maximize price. I think Charles has appreciated the way I was uh, bidding uh, for keywords <laughs> on short tail keywords. Uh, Joyce is asking if that's Nikola Tesla on my t-shirt, and indeed it is. Uh, and then back in the day, I, I, when uh, Edison was probably uh, just as famous, uh, he was famously asked, uh, what does it feel like to be the smartest person in the world? And I think his answer was, I don't know, ask Nikola Tesla. Uh, Tesla is amazing, and uh, I love his story. Uh, though, of course, the, the story at the time between Westinghouse and Tesla and Edison is, is fascinating. To me, it's as fascinating uh, these current wars as uh, the battle between Microsoft and Apple, uh, like I said, Wintel duo. So Microsoft, Intel, and, and, and Apple, and the PC versus uh, Apple in the 80s and 90s was. <laughs> Sebastian is asking, <laughs> who thinks business finance is worth killing the trees? So. I'll grant you that if you do an Excel model and you're predicting me your next five years and you're you're telling me, you know, what do you think your revenues are going to be in five years? My, I will not believe it. Um, that said, you do need a deck uh, to be able to pitch a story that's compelling, or at least to get in the door. In fact, often I need the deck to to get you in the door. But once you're in the door, I'd rather have a conversation. And I do want you to think through what your revenues are going to be the next 12 months and to have modeled them out, um, both top down and bottoms up. But obviously, do I believe that your five-year model? No. But at least you need to have the right ambition, right? If your ambition is to go from 1 million revenues to 2 to 4 to 5 to 8, you know, that's not a venture-backable startup. It may be a lifestyle business. It may be a great business, but it's not venture-backable. So understanding your ambitions is useful. And then having a sense of calibrating where you're going to go with the amount of money you raise now. And I need to be able to assess whether it's enough for you to get in your next round because all these companies are money losing. So the objective of your seed round is to get your A round. The objective of your A round is to get your B round. At some point, you get a profitability and you can arbitra do this arbitrage and growth and profitability. But for now, you know, I need to believe that your ambition will get you to the next round and that you can execute. Uh, Victoria is asking what so my view on uh, on competition and the red blue ocean strategy. I would much rather face no competition. So the I mean Peter Thiel is uh, is uh, mentioned that many times that it's way better to be a monopoly and you get better economics. And there are many ways to do that. One way to do that is to go after a niche. And those niches may appear small at the outset, may end up being a lot larger. And the beauty of going after these niches is you face usually a lot lower competition, you face a, a lower customer acquisition costs as a result of that, your, your market share increases. And usually once you dominate a category, you can find coin joint categories to attack. And that's why we like the vertical strategy. Of course, if you have to choose, I'd rather be the leader or invest in the leader or be building the leader in the horizontal category. You know, you'd rather be eBay than TCG player, which is a vertical magic the gathering marketplace. But if that position is already taken and there's an incumbent and, and and or if it requires too much capital to win, going in a vertical category where you can dominate the category with much less capital and build a multi billion dollar company is absolutely worthwhile. So I much rather go to places that are not too competitive and even though competition is not usually what kills you, what kills a startup is more likely you didn't find product market fit or you didn't have 
good unit economics or you can find a, a scalable acquisition channel. So even though you have product market fit and good economics, you can build a big company or you fight with your co-founder this is more likely to kill you. It's just more expensive to succeed in a world with a lot of competition. And, and it means that the ultimate returns may be, may be lower. And so if you think you're going to win, it's fine. But if you can avoid competition, all the better. So find vertical approaches that are differentiated such that you're not facing too much competition. So Farid is asking, do I think nonprofits um, should be run as startups, or are they ripe for disruption? What's interesting is I, I think there are a few nonprofits out there doing really interesting things. So if I think of Endeavor, which is a, one of the organizations I fund, they actually have this, uh, well, th their main mission is helping entrepreneurs in emerging markets build larger companies because they create jobs, they create growth, and, and they're positive for humanity. And to become more sustainable, they've actually created a venture fund where they're investing in startups, and this way they can capture some of the upside of the companies they're helping build. And so models like that, I think, make a lot of sense, and I hope we see more of those in the future as well. What company would have I love to found? Question by Thomas. The... You know, what, what's interesting is... Well, there are a lot of marketplaces out there that... I wish I'd founded and 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 could have kept running or improving. I guess starting with eBay and Craigslist back in the day. Um, I've actually tried to build. I built Craigslist type companies and eBay type companies around the world. I tried to uh, either buy or run Craigslist, uh, not successfully, and I would have loved that. In the last decade, clearly the two marketplaces that would have been the most fun to build and run are probably Uber and Airbnb, possibly Airbnb. Now, would I have been the right guy to run both? I'm not sure. My both are fighting in, entrenched incumbents monopolies uh, with the taxi industry and the hotel industry. They are, well, not necessarily monopolies in the case of the hotels, but definitely very well lobbied and regulated spaces. And you need to get permission from cities. I mean, they both decided to do a very famous uh, startup strategy, which is ask for forgiveness rather than the permission, which are exactly the type of things I would do. But then eventually you have to make right and make peace and, and with these regulators. And I think I would have hated being doing that part of like my, um, making peace with regulations that to me make no sense. Like there should be no local taxi monopoly and there's no reason Airbnb should be illegal if they agree to pay um, a hotel tax, they should be allowed to operate anywhere. And that would actually is better for owners as it creates more inventory, it decreases hotel costs, is better for cities. But the that's not the way regulation works. And, and so having conversations with regulators that I think are not particularly smart and don't have the best interests of humanity at heart is something that would grate upon me. And so I'm not sure, even though I wish I'd created them and I'd run them, I'm not sure I would have been the best person to do that. I think I would have been pretty good on the product side and fundraising, et cetera, but probably not so much on the dealing with regulators side. Can I hire someone to do it? Perhaps though, at the same time, many of these people want the CEO to be, to, they want to talk to the CEO. They want him to be eat the humble buy. And, 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 and I'm not sure I would have been very good at that, but it would have been fun. It would have been a fun journey. Uh, Anthony's asking, will I build another venture in the future? And uh, the answer is maybe. The I've, I actually built a company in, it's not well known, but in 2014, 2016, which was called Celid, which I then merged with Wallapop. I became chairman of Wallapop in Spain and CEO of the US operations, and then ultimately merged it with OfferUp and let go, well, let go first, then OfferUp, and so it didn't stop running it. I'm open to doing that again. I, I, when I did that for two years, found a really effective way to still be involved with FJ Labs and, and make it work. The, the issue, and I actually would love to be an entrepreneur. The issue is more, do I find an idea that I think is large enough and compelling enough that it's worth doing? And the reason it may not happen is unless I thought it was going to be big from the get-go, I probably wouldn't do it. And many ideas and many of the largest ideas didn't seem that big in the early days. So Airbnb started as a, uh, inflatable air mattresses in people's living rooms. That didn't seem like a very large idea. Uber started as black cars for rich people. Again, that didn't seem like a, a, a very big idea. Turns out they were much larger ideas and you can expand upon them. And so if I found an idea that was super compelling or if I was invited to be to run or join a, very, a company that I thought I could really create something really large, it'd be great. I'd, I have to find an int intelligent way to 
you know, make sure that uh, the FJ Labs LPs are still happy with the fact that I'd be doing that. You know, and I'm sure we can structure something intelligently. Um, I guess all that to say, I'm, I'm open-minded. I think it would be fun if it happened. And if it didn't, that's totally fine too. FJ Labs is a startup in its own right. I mean, we didn't join a fund. Well, Jose and I are building a new fund, which has uh, entails a lot of things and, and is interesting. Plus every year, in a way, we are building one or two new startups in Novo because of our startup studio model. And and so we get involved in building these companies. And I'm not against, frankly, even running one of these in the future, uh, should, should that make sense. And so it's, um, yeah, I, I would like to do it. Whether it'll happen is unclear. Uh, if, I, if I find an idea that I feel is my mission to go and build, the way OLX was. OLX was the company I felt I was meant to build. And if I could have, I would not have sold it. But we needed the cash to compete with our competitor and i felt the company would do better and when it was allied with nasfers or process and actually that proved to be correct so it was actually the right thing for the company to do to sell it even though personally i would have liked to continue to be the sole or the founder or ceo not sole because i had a partner but to be the one making the strategic decisions and on, on a go forward basis So Patrick is asking when I think of funding or financing with debt. Um, obviously, debt financing is great if you can get it, and uh, and if you because it, it it doesn't lead to dilution. Now there are things that I think, and it, and there are times where it's easier to get than not. It depends what you're using the debt for. So there are two main ways to get debt in venture capital. One is you just did an equity raise, and you have the SVBs of the world saying, well, you have four or five million in equity, therefore we can give you a one million line of credit. Um, and that's one way to get it. It's okay. Um, allows you to get a little bit more leverage, though, of course, it increases the probability that you, if you can't repay it because you haven't raised the next round, it puts a lot of pressure upon you and increases your ability, your your propensity go, to go under. The one thing I like to finance with debt the most is actually things more like inventory. So if you're selling a product, having debt to finance inventory makes a lot of sense. You don't want to be using equity for that. If you're buying homes, if you're open door, you want to be using a, a line of credit. If you're a rebag and you're selling bags and you need to buy them first, you want to be using a line of credit. And so using, if you're a SaaS business and you have a monthly recurring revenue that's predictable, then you kind of look perhaps like a bond. You could also use that for these things. The problem is it takes scale to get there. So it's unlikely you get that upfront. It's a good, but once you can get it, uh, either because you can prove that you the, the the repayment terms are good, that makes sense. Like many of the fintech companies or marketplaces, the the companies that are lending, they don't lend from the equity investors like us give. They lend from the capital provided to them by by third parties. So it, be it a hedge fund or a bank or or high net worth individuals lending them at different rates. The path typically is as follows. By the way. You, you launch your company, you're doing reasonably well, and let's say you want to finance loans that you're giving or you want to be financing your inventory. Like, most likely, banks will not lend you. And so you start with like high net worth individuals and you pay like 15% interest rate. Then perhaps you go to hedge funds and and you start convincing these high net worth individuals you're not very risky, so you start paying like 12% interest rate. And eventually, once you get to scale and you can borrow 10 million or 50 million or 100 million, then you can borrow from banks and then you pay whatever six, seven, eight percent interest rates. But you rarely start with a bank line of credit. You you build credibility together. And in fact, at the very beginning, most likely you're using equity. So more likely than not, the first few million you raise, you're going to be using you're part of the equity to buy the inventory, to finance the loans or whatever, to demonstrate that, that the credit worthiness. And then you can start borrowing from high net worth individuals, then from hedge funds, then eventually from banks. But you, you, if you could, obviously you would like to do that from the get-go, but you're, the ability to do that is very limited. And so while that is amazing, usually it takes a while to get and to get at the right terms. Is there a risk in jumping from an angel to a seed round or is it just semantics? the by hub financiero well the way i i consider the angel round is the pre-seed round it's when you're the first million dollars and um there's usually a team an mvp a DAC, maybe not even an mvp and and there's usually no vcs investing there it's a collection of angels that are writing checks and maybe there are a few pre-seed funds like a four that are investing there are not very many so it might be like 20 v angels writing 50k checks that leads to that round the seed round, which is the round after that, comes usually 12 months later. The company has launched, they have more of a team, they're doing 150K a month in GMV of their marketplace, and they're raising three at nine. 
if I was an angel and I had enough capital and the company had actually executed on the plan from angel to seed, I would totally invest in the seed. There, there's no ri risk there per se. If anything, the company is de-risk, you're paying a higher price because it's de-risk. That said, if you have to choose, and, and by the way, many companies are not going to make it there. Many companies are not going to raise their seed around. Many are going to have died. And so perhaps the ones that have, that have made it, you do want it back. That said, if you have to choose between reinvesting in a few of these or having a more diversified portfolio, the math suggests that having a more diversified portfolio makes more sense. So as an angel investor, if you have more than 100 investments, you're going to make you're going to do really well. If you have more than 500 investments, you're going to do really, really well. And probably 50 is on the low end of um, uh, of enough diversification where you're going to be able to be successful. So I'd, I'd have, if you're investing that early, given the high failure rate, you want a really diversified portfolio, especially given the power law in venture. So I'm looking at the upcoming questions. Do I subscribe to the Y Combinator model um, that user and revenue growth should be the core focus? And I guess I, I'd, I'd give you two questions like, is there value in things like YC? Well, lucky you're in luck. That is actually my topic for next week, uh, which is, should you build a company on your own as a first time founder? Should you join an accelerator or incubator? Or should you be part of a venture studio? And I'll go through the pros and cons of all three. YC definitely has value in the incubator accelerator model in terms, especially if you're a foreign founder, they'll increase your valuation or access to capital dra dramatically. And if you're a B2B, start, B2B SaaS startup targeting startups, their network is so powerful, I would definitely try to get in. And I think Brex, for instance, the founder uh, would definitely say uh, he, he funnily benefiting for, benefited from being able to sell to the other startups in YC and in their entire portfolio. Um, and, and but there are pros and cons. Now, should you focus on user and, re and and revenue growth for your seed round? Absolutely, right. Like the your angel round, the million is actually so you can find product market fit. And by the time you get your seed round. We expect you to have gone in the marketplace space to, let's say, 150K a month in GMV, taking 15%. In the SaaS space, maybe 30 or 40K a month in MRR. In our e commerce space, maybe same thing, 150K a month in, 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 in revenues. And if you are not, if you didn't find a scalable customer acquisition channel, if you didn't get to that level of scale, perhaps you're not ready for a seed round. And so you do, and growth matters because we expect you to be able to kind of 4X from there for your A round. And so your the growth rate you have matters dramatically because you need to be able to get there. So, so I apologize people on uh, who will be listening to this on iTunes and Spotify as I'm reading uh, questions and which is creating moments of silence, but this is continuing. So Charles asking what philosophies I had when I started this journey that, that worked for me then that perhaps no longer work today and uh, which ones have continued to be true. I'm trying to think through whether they're philosophies that I had that, that, that worked then that no longer work today. But there are definitely a number of underlying philosophies that I think um, continue to work to this day. The first one is to frankly take risks and chances because you're taking less of a risk than you think. So being an entrepreneur, for instance, most people would say, oh my God, that's crazy. There is a, you know, your five-year survival rate is 7%. You're more than likely than not to fail and or to go under. The thing is, what does failing and or going under mean and what are the consequences? And and for many of the people that are founders, the, the reality is they went to great schools. They, they used to have great jobs, be it at McKinsey or a bank or they worked at a startup. Should they fail, they can always go back to these jobs. They will land on their feet. The and so the 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 risk that we are taking and they are taking is actually smaller than it is perceived. And most people are risk averse, right? And I am probably going to do a, a a playing with the unicorns episode on risk aversion, where if you ask people, do you what's your preference between fifty percent probability of getting two hundred dollars and fifty percent probability of getting zero versus getting a sure one hundred, almost everyone wants a sure one hundred. And 
you kind of need to have, even though the expected value is the same. And so you need to kind of have an expected value that's much greater, maybe 50% of $300 and 50% of zero for people to be willing to take that chance over the sure thing. And that risk aversion is true kind of across the board. And so if you take marginally more risk, you're highly rewarded for it in society. And so taking that chance is highly rewarding. Not to mention, I think it's highly rewarding, not just financially, it's highly rewarding in terms of doing the things you'd rather be doing. Um, and so most people fear failure. I guess the general, so general bucket number one, you know, be more comfortable with the risk. And now, of course, I, I'm not sure why, I, I'd have to think through what the correct story is gonna be on the rust side because I also love heli skiing and kite surfing and ice climbing and car racing. And, and so perhaps I'm also, I don't know which came first. Um, well, I was always entrepreneurial, but also liked risk or didn't have the same, I had a much higher risk tolerance than most to begin with. And so can you build it or not? I have to think through what the correct answer is, but like be more tolerant of risk, number one. Number two, um, be comfortable with failure. People are, are afraid of failing and I would argue that I failed my way to success. My first company in a way failed and I failed personally and publicly in a massive way. And um, and it was okay. I, I learned a lot, landed on my feet and was able to do it again. And and it's both failure at a, at a big level, like I essentially went bankrupt, but it's also failure at a little level. Like every, most decisions you make as an entrepreneur are going to be wrong. You're gonna pick the wrong business model. You're gonna pick the wrong design. You're gonna, you're gonna, and so we multivariate test a lot of things. You know, so have the humility to think through, you don't know everything and just try and, and, and see what the correct answer is. And through, so productive, disruptive product change often is this sum total of 1% innovation or improvements done over and over and over again. And so be comfortable with failure at, at both the micro level and the macro level. And if you take the right lessons from it, obviously don't, 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 the objective should not be failure, but you have to be comfortable with it. Um, you will actually ultimately do well. And, and most people's that are extremely successful, you only see the successes, but it's like crazy ups and downs. It's never a continuous straight line. I mean, look at Elon, who with Tesla almost went bankrupt uh, a few times. He had to leverage all of his personal assets. He had to start sleeping in people's couches. And, you know, I'm not necessarily want to put myself in the same bucket, but I, you know, essentially failed with my first company. I had to live in New York, sleeping in the office of the cat at the couch of the office, like living at two dollars a day in the city. And um, but. You, you learn a lot and you grow through these experiences. So be comfortable with failure. Um, as I said, you, you, you will fail yourself to success. You can't, it's very rare that you just immediately succeed. And if you do, it may be due to luck and that will lead to wrong, bad decisions and bad habit. And, and in fact, if I had been as successful as I'd expected to be in my first startup, I would probably would have been an arrogant, insufferable uh, you know, kid and, and, and probably would have led to my downfall. And so eating a massive piece of humble pie and realizing that I didn't know everything and, you know, and actually was human and could fail. It was actually a very useful life lesson to have at the age of 25 or 26, because at that point in time, I never failed at anything in life. I'm sure there are other philosophies, but you know, in the interest of time, I'll move on to the next questions. Uh, how do I see that you are USZ behave in the next 24 months? I, the, it's a macro question really driven by both a combination of interest rate expectations and financial <laughs> and, and, and how, how aggressive from a fiscal perspective, the different, the different countries are going to be and what the inflationary expectations are going to be. The reason the Euro has strengthened dramatically in the last three months is that the, the U the US, the, the Fed essentially announced that we're going to be at zero interest rates for a long time, that it's going to be targeting slightly higher than 2% inflation uh, in the foreseeable future. And the, the the stimulus has been large and there's an expectation at some point of another of a subsequent one. And the expectation is that will be truer in the US that, than, than in Europe where there needs to be more co coordination. Now, what it'll be into in the next few years is what 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 the, what the policymakers essentially decide in terms of uh, fiscal easement and interest rate policy. And so who knows? I, I don't really pay attention to it. I don't care all that much. The way I think about these things is 
what is my life cost structure in? In my case, it's, it's dollars. And so when I get euro exits, I convert the euros to dollars, and it's good to be in the core currency that, that your costs and, and expenses are in. Um, I don't spend that much time. I don't, I don't necessarily hedge the positions, etc. I've done it in the past, but it depends. Uh, the, and sometimes it's, it, it, and, and the problem in my world is you don't know when the exits come, so you can't actually time the hedging um, very well. We, we have a company in Brazil right now that's going public, and uh, we're doing, a, I think, a 35x return or so. Had the REI not divided by three over that time period since we invested, it would have been a 100x return. The problem is when I invested, I had no idea that the exit would be today, you know, six years down the path. So hedging for that is is not really possible, but it's okay. I mean, we're going to do amazingly well regardless. And uh, I I can take into I don't take that much consideration in the macro environment as well. So I'll, I'll take a step back. Do I care about the macro environment? And for the most part, the answer is no because the macro environment is today's macro environment. The macro environment that I care about is the macro environment when I sell in the future, five years, seven years, 10 years later, when the startup is at scale. And you can't, no one can predict what that will look like. Now, there's some countries that are making decisions that are so bad that it looks like you should probably avoid them for the next decade. And that's why we, we moved away from Russia and we moved away from Turkey um, about a decade ago, and we, for a while, decreased our investments in Brazil. But when you're investing in the U.S., you know, even though right now we're in a difficult recession and economic time, it doesn't prevent us from investing. If anything, it, it's actually an amazing creator of innovation and productivity. And so if I look at the most interesting companies that were built in the last decade, all of them were created in the 08, 09 crisis. So Uber, Slack, WhatsApp, Airbnb. And I expect the same to be true in the next decade. The many of the companies that are going to be defining that decade will have been created in 2020, 2021, or maybe even 2019, but will have lived through the crisis in, in a way that will be transforming for them and will be completely game-changing and they will be the defining companies of the next decade. So the current macro environment, you know, obviously has negative impact on people's lives or maybe makes it harder to raise money, but the I doesn't really impact your ultimate investment decision. What matters is the macro in five, 10 years, and who knows what that's going to be. So Genius Morty, I guess, are replying to the question for before, everything is impact investing. Not sure everything writ large, right? If, you, if you're investing in uh, shale oil or uh, yeah, or building a nuclear, a nuclear power plant, probably not. But in venture, I'd say most things are impact investing because they are deflationary and, and trying to improve people's uh, user experiences. And so, yeah, I'd say that's a, a reasonably fair statement. Igor is asking, which investment gave me the best return and why? Now, the question there, you know, it's funny because there are many definitions of best return. Uh, best return could be the most money I made versus or the highest multiple. And, and those are two very different answers. So the most absolute dollars I made is probably Alibaba. I made a reasonably late stage investment at Alibaba at a $15 billion valuation. I wrote a million dollar check with like $4 a share, made like $20 million out of that. And on a multiple level, um, and I will immediately admit that this has nothing to do with skill, it was all luck, I invested in a Turkish mobile gaming company called Gram Games. And I invested because my one analyst that had just joined us knew the team from Booth, said they were amazing, the and said we should invest. And it was his first deal, and we're like, okay, you know, it's really out of scope for us. We usually write 500K checks. Maybe I'll write a 50K check. And their premise was, Clash of Clans, which is this game built by Supercell, is doing really well on, on iPhone. It wasn't yet on Android, wasn't yet in emerging markets. They would do Clash of Clans types games for emerging markets on Android. And that was, I have to admit, a total disaster. The underlying premise of our investment failed. The games did okay, but now nothing took off. And we kind of were like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna shut down the company. We're gonna liquidate it. And for fun, one uh, one of them, uh, their engineers had built this little casual game called Tenten, kind of like a math game. I, I don't know if you guys ever played the 2048, where it's like 2, 4, 8, uh, 16, 32, et cetera. So it's one of those games. And instantly super successful. And I think they realized, 
well, maybe instead of trying to build these complex games where you need storytelling, perhaps voice acting, and complex development, let's build these casual games. And now that we seem to understand how to make them and to make them work, and they became a very successful casual gaming company to the point they got to tens of millions of profits a year. And Zynga bought them a few years ago for $250 million plus an earnout. And I think the 50K is going to be at the end of the day with the earnout like $8 million or something like that. So it's 130X or 140X. But invested a small amount in a geography where I don't invest that much anymore. I used to invest before Erdogan became president of Turkey in a category I don't really invest in, in a thesis that failed, and we really got lucky. They they pivoted and became very successful, and uh, my, it was my highest multiple ever, probably the highest IRR. Well, maybe not the highest IRR, but definitely the highest multiple. And um, you do well. So there's a, a fair amount of serendipity and luck in, in these things, and that was super fun. Is um, Carolina is asking if I should invest in Bitcoin. The... So let's walk through the use case for Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin, the it, I'd say Bitcoin, the equivalent, the best way to explain it is probably it's digital gold. It's a store of value. So it's not actually a currency. And the reason it's not a currency is it's actually complex to trade um, and, and it's deflationary in nature because they're issuing fewer and fewer as uh, even though demand is going up. And, and as a result, it's not really a great means of exchange but it's a good store of value because it's deflationary. And if you live in a country that in the past says, let's say, arbitrarily confiscated your assets or that is suffering from hyperinflation or where there's a risk that, that they will take your assets away from you in general, um, it actually makes sense to hold Bitcoin. So if you were in Argentina, you know, obviously Bitcoin didn't exist in 2000, but You've seen over the last 20 years periods of hyper or high inflation, uh, confiscation of the retirement assets. You've seen the pezification of your dollars. Um, if you were in Venezuela, if you were in Zimbabwe with crazy inflation. So the alternative you could have is you could buy diamonds, you could buy gold, but they can be stolen away from you. Not that cryptocurrency cannot be stolen away from you. They, they're hard to keep safely. And so having things like Bitcoin makes a lot of sense. Now, if you live in a country like the U.S., where you have access to banks and a financial system where it's reasonably trustworthy, you have access to other asset class, do you want it as part of your overall portfolio of investments? Perhaps as a small percentage. Um, it's a hedge against fiat currencies devaluating, uh, given that countries have been printing a lot of money. It's, it's definitely possible that it happens. It's um, also, but like gold, it doesn't generate interest, right? It doesn't generate income. And so I, I, my general preference when I buy assets is for them to be yielding, uh, to be creating something. So if I'm investing in a startup, it's creating value through the fact that that startup is ultimately growing, getting revenues, providing value to humanity. Or if you invest in other assets, they pay rent or they pay dividends or they, they, they pay interest payments. And, and for the way these assets, the value is calculated is it's, it's, net present value of discounted cash flows in the future. With Bitcoin, and like with gold, that's not true. It's more supply and demand. Do do people want that uh, value that asset class? It's also true things like art or sports cars uh, that are collectibles. And so I try to avoid these for the most part. Um, if you have concerns with fiat currency, maybe having some as a hedge makes sense. Does it make sense for most people? Probably, perhaps not, though it's easier than ever to buy and trade with things like uh, Coinbase. I think the guy in the t-shirt will continue to have his stock rising. Well, the guy in the t-shirt is actually Nikola Tesla, uh, who had an amazing life, but is no longer sadly with us. Do I think the Tesla stock will continue rising? To be honest, I do not follow public markets at all. I have uh, zero investments in stocks. Usually when one of the companies I'm an investor in goes public, I sell because I'd rather be playing in the private part. So I have no perspective on stock markets as a whole, and I've even lost perspective on specific stocks like Tesla, Amazon, Google, Apple, Alibaba, et cetera. I, don't, I just don't follow it. it the, it's not my, my area of expertise. I don't really allocate cycles to it. So I can't come intelligently. Um, what I have done is a completely non-traditional investment strategy for my wealth management. I don't own bonds. I don't, you know, real estate I consider to be consumption in my case. It's like a place that I live in. It's not meant to be generating uh, either value or income. And so it's really a 
bunch of cash as a as a hedge uh, or as a, a, to have ability to be able to deploy it when um, when I see investment opportunities that are great, either, either in times of crises or normally when it comes to startups, and a whole bunch of tech startup investments. And literally that's it. So it's a kind of a barbell portfolio of the type that probably Nassim Taleb would, 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 would like uh, and doesn't have any of the traditional portfolio construction that people have. So cannot come into the stock market, you know, be it Tesla or others now. Is Tesla leading the way to a combination of electrification and autonomy? Absolutely. I suspect that the value of Tesla is probably driven more by ultimately autonomy and self-driving than electrification, which is more commodity. But I can't com- I don't even know how much they're worth, and uh, so I can't comment evaluation. But I do like for the products they make, and I like the fact that Elon. I think Elon's goal or role in this world is to accelerate trends. So. A lot of things he's doing would have happened anyway, but they're happening a lot better, a lot faster. And I think that's actually a massive net positive for humanity, um, both on the space exploration or things like the Boring Company or or Tesla. So I'm a fan and I hope he keeps doing amazing things. I hope his companies survive, which is not a given, especially in the case of Tesla, because I do think they things would be moving slower if it wasn't for them. reading more questions. Paul Graham says, founders should learn to code. Advice against in your video. What do you think of this approach? The, so get, get, I understand, look, if you know how to code, it's better and it makes you a better, it's going to make you a better product CEO and it's going to be make you a better manager of, of, res, of tech resources because you're going to understand what's hard and what's easy. And so when you do your your allocation of, of resources and you pick the projects to build, you're going to make much better educated decisions. But should you be building your own MVP versus should you be allocating your time to finding product market fit, thinking through the best acquisition tra- strategies, et cetera, I would say the latter. Um, there are a few exceptions, right? It kind of also depends on the business you're going after. The businesses I have a tendency to go build and invest in are business uh, or marketplaces. And the key success factor in these marketplaces is actually finding product market fit, finding positive unit economics, and, and finding scalable customer acquisition channels. And so allocating your time to doing that is more valuable than learn, building the MVP and learning to code. The, that said, if you have the time and uh, it's it's obviously better, uh, it will make you a better CEO and a better product, a better allocator of resources on the tech side, I guess, when you're making these tech decisions. A long time since Count said Swiss Montigny. Indeed, I don't know who that is, but it has been a long time and I did love uh, uh, spending time there as a kid in Nice. When are you sorry? I'm uh, mumbling to myself as I'm reading different questions. Uh, I'm not sure I understand this one, so skip through that. Overrated or underrated? Using pair metrics for measuring KPIs, so me- setting two goals to measure something rather than one. <laughs> the the um, the question, the issue with KPIs is you need to be in OKRs is you need to be very thoughtful about the ones that you set because otherwise your team, if you, if especially if you incentivize people against them, um, you may lead, you may end up with the wrong, the, the wrong structure or the wrong, or the wrong outcomes because you 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 put the wrong variable. So if you're if you tell people you're focusing on growth and only on growth, then you may get a lot of sales that may be not profitable. If you focus purely on profits, you may not get the growth you need. And so being very thoughtful about the correct KPI or OKR um, really matters. The, you know, for, for instance, it, you could you, if it's only NPS, you could create a delightful user experience, but it may not scale and it may not work. So I guess the answer is it depends. Most companies do manage to not one single metric, but multiple metrics. And there, there are a few exceptions, right? Like in March of this year, when it looked like the world might be ending, for most startups, the, the, the there was only one KPI that started mattering. If you at the scale is be profitable, so you are a master of your own destiny. And if you're small, is extend your runway. So it's like cut your burn as much as you can in, in order to make sure you survive. And 
And so these moments of crises might lead you to have a single KPI. In general, most of the companies that we invest in have tracked multiple KPIs and, and incentivize people with multiple KPIs and OKRs because we, we want to make sure that it, it, you get a balance of growth and profitability and unit economics and user experience. And, and, and then you focus on the ones where you're doing less well uh, if need be. So I'd say for most people, you're measuring multiple things. Now, that's true at, for the company as a whole. So if you're looking at the, you're setting like global objectives for next quarter, next year, et cetera. For specific teams, though, you may be focusing on a very specific um, uh, objective. So if I'm doing a, a funnel analysis the, the from visitor to purchase, so the conversion funnel matters most, then you're, the per, there may be a team with sole task is that conversion funnel and optimizing that. You know, Maybe if you have three shorter pages instead of one long page, you have, you have long page, you have a higher conversion rate. So I'd say... For the company as a whole, you probably have a number of KPIs. For specific teams, you may have one very specific one that you, and once you've done that, you do you go to another one. Someone's asking if I see different um, approaches between European VCs and and French and European ones and US ones. The problem is we're not a very traditional VC, and so I'm not sure. I'd, I'd say in general the consensus seems to be, and I'm going to say where the consensus is, that American VCs are willing to put more cap, more capital earlier with fewer proof points to go after growth, and European VCs are want more, probably pay, put invest less capital at somewhat lower valuations, but I don't actually have the data to back it up to see if that's true, or, or, or if it, it used to be true. Is it still true today? I'm not sure. There's definitely been more capital and amazing VCs and amazing investments coming out of Europe of late, so... Perhaps it's true. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I guess uh, I guess the answer is I don't know. VCs want to invest, so that's Samir, in, in global companies, but pref preferably locally. Um, isn't that unfair to other economies, economies ecosystems, and ventures? <laughs> the reason that, ex that is, by the way, is um, VCs live in reasonably concentrated areas. So let's say the Bay Area in San Francisco or in New York. And most of them are making concentrated bets, bets in a few companies. So when they invest, they're going to be on your board. They're going to spend a lot of time with you. And so they are in, if you are close to them, you make it easy for them to, to, be on that, to make that decision. If you're based, let's say, Miami, or if you're in another country or geography and you're far from them, they, they need to think through, is this investment worth it enough for me that I'm going to change my quality of life, which is rather good, you know, working my job in, in Silicon Valley, and get myself in a plane five, six times a year to go bo to board meetings? Is it is it worth it? And so for many investments, the answer is no. And by the way, if you put yourself in in a city that's not the core cities, it's actually usually harder to get sales. It's harder It's harder to attract talent. You may not have the, the density of talent. You may not be surrounded by amazing other amazing people. And, and so you may not have this like crazy serendipity of amazing ideas of sex with each other. So is it fair? Probably not, You know, but it makes a huge difference. And so to the extent possible, I would say, base yourself in in these core geographies where the vcs are right if you're in france if you're in paris you're going to be, have a much easier time raising venture capital than if you're in nice my hometown if you're in the uk you're better off being in in in, in london if in, in germany you probably are better off in berlin and that's true in most of these countries the and and it's just the way of the that business works and so it's okay to start from wherever you 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 can start from it wherever i mean as i said the open source and low code and no code revolution has made it much easier and cheaper to build companies and we're seeing actually companies emerge from everywhere but ultimately if you want to be raising venture capital you need to be where the venture capital is and it happens to be in the larger ecosystems and the larger countries in the major cities and so i would definitely move there because vcs are not going to be coming to you you're creating more barriers for yourself by by asking them to do things they're not used to and in changing their behavior pattern so if you already fall in their workflow much much better Hi from Nice, uh, Sebastian. Um, let's see. Let's see if we have uh, any more questions. So Alex uh, Varman is asking, uh, and hi, by the way, is asking whether or not my university education at Princeton was useful. 
so there's a perhaps a raging debate like how useful is a college education and um, there's becoming a consensus, or for many people, it, it's it's actually overrated. It's too expensive relative to what you get out of it. I'd say if you can get in the very best schools, right, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, et cetera, it's still worth it. It's extraordinarily expensive. Maybe you leave with that, but the doors that it opens, the, the opportunities you get out of it are completely worth it. The issue is more for the schools in the middle, right? So if you're in a school that's ranked like 50 or 100 is it worth spending that much capital there perhaps not now when you look at like and i guess what peter thiel has been doing um with with the 20 under 20 and like helping people build companies um without going to college i think it's misunderstood i don't think he's saying no one should go to college by the way like he i think he's saying there's a very small subset of uh, of humans who are really smart they they probably could have gotten their PhD at 15 you know they're 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 self-taught they're they're hardworking. they're motivated they're they really are like the top 0.01 percent of like ambition passion intelligence and do you, will can they become entrepreneurs without going and getting a normal college education and the answer is absolutely yes um, chances are I could have built a startup company without college at, at, in, in, from a underlying skill set perspective. Now, that said, do I like a traditional liberal arts education? Absolutely. I think it gives you, if you are curious, it, 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 you, you can learn a little bit of everything about anything. And I took classes in everything from like Russian literature to Mandarin to the Peloponnesian War and the Roman Empire. I took molecular biology and like classes and everything and I loved it. And, and is it pretty useful in life? Probably not. Does it make me a better entrepreneur to know a lot about a lot of topics or to aspire to be a polymath and we're a Renaissance man? Probably not, actually. Many of the very best entrepreneurs are single-mindedly focused on, on their startup and they know their category extremely well and they know very little else. It doesn't make them succeed less. Perhaps it makes them less interesting human beings, but it doesn't make them less successful. And so... Probably not for everyone. If you, you there are some people for whom it, it, it is a waste. Now, that said, I would really think through if you're not in a position to get in the very best schools, does it really make sense to go to middling's college versus alternatives and or and, and forms of online education that are emerging? I, I think that the answer is probably not, and we're going to see a massive wave of failures of of schools in the middle that are too expensive relative to the value they provide. And we're going to see massive disruption in online education where you're going to see either lower cost alternatives that provide a good enough education becoming available. And of course, at the high end, you're going to re retain the, the Ivy League schools. The schools in the middle are probably going to suffer and rightly so. I don't think they're delivering value for money and uh, things have to change from that perspective. Charles asking, would I consider myself quite open? <laughs> what else would we say open and creative? I think the this show is probably the, the, the reflection of that. I I have a tendency, I, I believe in radical honesty and transparency and like seeing things as I see them. And that's true in my personal and professional life. I I like sharing. Um, it, partly, I'm not sure why. I, I, I think it helps uh, clarify and structure my thoughts. I like helping people. I, I've always seen me as kind of a, that professor type in terms of like, sharing best practices and and uh so i am open though funnily enough historically i used to be really shy and introverted how do i stay creative i'd say number there are a lot of ways right like you meet i, I like to surround myself and interact with a lot of interesting people i host these intellectual salons i read a lot i read 50 to 100 books a year now mind you many of them are things like sci-fi and fantasy etc and some are also non-fiction but it's probably a 60 70 30 split and in, in favor of fiction and uh, in the trashy maybe not trashy but like you know sci-fi soap opera etc genre and 30 percent fiction and um i've uh, i've dabbled in psychedelics uh but i'm not sure that makes me more creative i think these were interesting experiences more than anything else and do them once in a while um no i think it's like keeping an open mind meeting lots of interesting people reading a lot of interesting things and um yeah questioning questioning the why and 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 even personal beliefs like just yeah staying open and curious i guess curiosity has always been an underlying driver and why be open i think it can say it actually helps refine thought processes meet other interesting people be challenged etc and Lawrence is asking if i watched the social dilemma and so what are my thoughts about it so i have not watched the social dilemma 
the I do watch some TV shows, but very selectively. Like it used to be IMDb over eight, um, and in a genre where I, I need to be in the mood for them. The I guess these days I'm watching The Boys, for instance, uh, and, and there are a few other shows that I would recommend. Now, the reason I'm not, I don't find the social dilemma, and I've, I've read what the premise is about, and I, I've had summaries of it, super compelling, is every time a new medium has come along, it's been highly criticized for corrupting the values of our youth. Um, so when the bicycle was first introduced, for instance, and, and, and I encourage you to research that, uh, people were saying, oh, it's giving women freedom uh, to... to to basically misbehave, it, it, it's creating, it, 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 and, and the bicycle was actually see, seen as a sin and evil that was going to corrupt the morals of young women because they had the freedom to go to go away and and, and perhaps express their sexual identity somewhere or somehow. Um, people thought it was extremely dangerous to do it. When the book was invented, people thought the same thing. When TVs was invented, people thought the same thing. When radio came along, people thought the same thing. When the new music genres like rock and roll, people saw the same, thought the same thing. It's like corrupting our morals and identity and, and disrupting or, or, or disrupting the political genre and, and system. And it always feels like it's like the older generation looking at the younger one and and not understanding or fe feeling that the quality of life and morality has, has has been fundamentally changed, and so I suspect people are are, are feeling the same way about uh, social networks uh, today as uh, other elderly people felt about TV or radio and the print or the books or frankly even the bicycle in the past. So I am way less critical and way more open-minded about the not just the ills and of course it's possible to be addicted to social media to be addicted to uh, games or technology etc but also about their benefits and, and the ability to stay in touch and the ability and the, the 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 ability to communicate and organize etc and um i find that a lot of these documentaries on netflix come in with a specific viewpoint they're not objective and 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 so while i'm happy to watch them occasionally the i always try to research like the underlying research but the, the one on the, on the bicycle is really funny i feel like look at all the articles that came out when the bicycles were released it basically is exactly the same story that i'm seeing about like the ills of social media today and uh oh and i guess they mentioned in the documentary I think uh, we've, <laughs> that's quite the, the episode, I answered a lot of questions on a lot of different topics, and so this was great, I'm uh, going to end it there, uh, thank you all for watching and participating, and uh, if you're on YouTube and uh, you see this X post, so, you know, subscribe, uh, I put a comment, and definitely if you have ideas or suggestions for upcoming episodes, that'd be great, and like it if you like it. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, I'll probably be covering as a first-time entrepreneur, should you build a company on your own? Should you join a, an accelerator or incubator, a live Y Combinator? Or should you be in a studio a la FJ Labs or others? And what are the pros and cons of the different approaches? And um, we'll take it from there.